Our topic for today is empirical and molecular formulas. Um, quite simply, the difference between an empirical and a molecular formula is that an empirical formula is really kind of like a reduced fraction. Um, you are, have, have done fractions for probably many years in arithmetic class already, and so you know that if you have a fraction like two-fourths, you can reduce that fraction to one-half, and you can put it in the very simplest form. Well, really, molecular formulas and empirical formulas are really just like reducing fractions, because what you're going to do is you're going to get the very smallest whole number ratio between the atoms that are in a compound. Um, now, this is going to be true uh, for covalently bonded compounds. As the author of your text says, for an ionic compound, you're always going to use the um, simplest whole number ratio because it's always a matter of you have positive ions and negative ions that are attracted to each other, and they're not so much bonded together as the ions are attracted to each other. In Compounds that have molecular formulas, you're going to have covalent bonds, and sometimes these molecules can grow quite large, but I could still figure out what the simplest whole number ratio between them is. Um, we'll do a couple of examples here. The very first example I've got is uh, C4H12, and with that particular example, if I look at um, the subscripts, I have a 4 and a 12. Well, what is the the biggest thing that I can divide both 4 and 12 by? Well, 4 will go into both of those. So if I take 4 and divide it by 4, I just get 1. If I take um, 12 and divide it by 4, I get 3. So the empirical formula for this compound is going to be CH3. All I did is take the numbers and reduce them down to the lowest, lowest possible um, ratio. Now, if you divided both of those by 2 instead and you got C2H6, you should have looked at that and said, oh, well, I can take that down again. Just kind of like if you uh, are, are reducing fractions and you don't pick the biggest number the first time through, sometimes you have to reduce it twice. Well, it's the same thing that's going to be here. Uh, if you end up having to reduce it twice, it's not a big deal, as long as by the time you get finished, you've got the simplest ratio possible. Okay, let's look at this, this next one. I've got C8. H18, O2. Well, uh, this one hopefully is a little more obvious that the, the thing that you're going to divide through all of these by is 2. So 8 divided by 4 is, uh, or I'm sorry, 8 divided by 2 is 4. Uh, 18 divided by 2 is 9, and 2 divided by 2 is 1. So the empirical formula for this molecular formula is C4H9O. Okay? Look at this next one. Um, SI is silicon, so the same family as carbon. So I have um, Ci3H9O2. Well, the 3 and the 9 would reduce, but I have a 2, and there isn't any single number that's going to go into 3, 9, and 2. There's no common, common factor there at all. So in this particular case, the empirical and the molecular formula are the same. So this one is still going to be Si3H9O2. In this case, the empirical and molecular formulas are the same. Okay. Um, last one, P4O10. Um, both of these are even numbers. I can divide both of them by 2. So if I divide 4 by 2, I get 2. If I divide 10 by 2, I get 5. So my empirical formula is P2O5. Okay. So that's what happens if you have a molecular formula and you want to go to an empirical formula, but you, if you have an empirical, you can also go to a molecular. And so I've got a couple of examples uh, on your sheet here uh, for that as well. Um, you look at the next problem down, it says the empirical formula for a compound is PO3. And so I know that's what the empirical formula is. And the molar mass is 158 grams per mole. What is the molecular formula? Okay, well, the molar mass of the molecular formula is 158. The, in order to figure that out, I'm going to have to say, well, what's the molar mass for this one? Well, the molar mass for this, if you look at your periodic table, uh, phosphorus is in the neighborhood of 31, if I remember correctly. And then um, each oxygen is 16. And so when you add that together, um, you're going to have a molar mass of 
0.97 um, grams for every one mole. Okay. Now, I know that the molar mass for the molecular formula is 158. So if I take 158 and I divide it by 78.97, I come up with, once you round it, you come up with about two. So what that means then is that you're gonna take each of these subscripts and you're gonna multiply it by two. So your molecular formula for this is gonna be P206, okay? Um, let's try one more like that. The empirical formula for a compound is CH2O. And if you look at that, you'll probably also recognize this as being um, just the generic formula for any carbohydrate because it has a carbon and a water in it. And he mentioned specifically that this is the, the empirical formula for a lot of carbohydrates. Um, for this particular carbohydrate, it says the molar mass is 180.1 grams per mole. What's the molecular formula? Well, again, to find the molecular formula, I need to find the molar mass of this one. So the molar mass for this, um, carbon is 12.01. I have two hydrogens at 1.01 each, and my oxygen is 16. And so that is gonna give me, if you add all those up, you're gonna have um, 30.03 grams for every mole of this. Now he says that the molar mass for the molecular formula is 180.1. So if I take 180.1 and I divide it by 30.03, you divide that out, you're gonna get six. So what that means is that you're gonna to have to multiply all of these subscripts through by six. And so your molecular formula is gonna be C6H12O6. And that probably looks familiar from biology because uh, that's the formula for glucose, okay? So those are the methods that you're going to use for converting molecular to empirical formulas and then empirical back to molecular formulas.